Welcome to Godsplaining, contemplative preachers, contemporary age. Each week, join the Dominican friars as they consider all things Catholic. Hello, welcome back to Godsplaining. I'm Father Gregory Pine coming at you from Washington, D.C. We're still in the part of our lives where we're recording episodes slightly ahead of time and then moving to different places either in the United States or outside of the United States and then posting them after the move. So this is another event of time travel. I'm in DC, but when this episode goes live, I'll be in Switzerland. So it is a pleasure to be with you both in the United States and in Switzerland in different senses without breaking the law of non-contradiction. I'm joined here by Father Bonaventure Chapman, who is also in the act travel, not time travel, but space travel. Father Bonaventure, how you doing? I'm doing great. Couldn't be better. Well, I mean, that's always possible, I suppose, because of uh, sin and grace, but doing well. Nice. Okay. That's an honest appraisal, a modest appraisal. Um, the, the, the subject of this episode, he says somewhat haltingly, um, breaking literary form of the intended result, is uh, literature and Graham Greene. So Father Bonaventure and I, we often talk about literature. I remember one time we were novices. We were giving a tour to the new novices who had just come in, you know, during the last few weeks of our novitiate. And um, you said something to them about, you know, this is not a time to start or begin your philosophical and theological formation. There's all kinds of time for that. You said you should read some spiritual theology. You should read scripture and commentaries. And you said, every night I force myself to read a novel. And when I heard you say that, I was like, holy smokes, this guy reads a whole novel every night. But I guess indefinite, you know, like articles can be used in a variety of senses. So I guess now that's you read from a novel or part of a novel every night. Is that true? Yeah, I just, yeah, I just misspoke. Um, everyone makes mistakes. Um, some of us don't understand <laughs> the English language. Uh, so I read, um, I intend, I have, I have a firm intention to read from a, a literary event on paper every every evening um because otherwise i would not have be in contact with true things so nice yeah Yeah, that wasn't me calling you out about the way in which you use indefinite articles i think it was more calling myself out for being bewildered because as you often say language um because Mm. in any speech act you basically can presume that the other person understands what you're saying unless you're really really bad and uh i think we've gotten better at the art of communication um, but, but literature in general, maybe to reorient our audience to an ongoing conversation that we've had probably in like six, seven, maybe even eight installments at this point, um, you, you force yourself as it were, or maybe you are delighted to read hmm. a novel every evening. Um, otherwise you're reading Kant and related scholars. Otherwise I'm reading St. Thomas Aquinas and commentary thereupon. What, like, what do we gain by reading literature? What's the point? It's, it seems the point is to get at the human condition from, we should say, a, a lower altitude, it strikes me, one, and a different vantage point, two. So lower altitude in the sense of philosophy and theology is usually skyscraper level stuff or higher, sometimes stratospheric, and then you just, you're out in space, um, Jeff Bezos kind of action. But uh, hmm. literature keeps it down to the ground. It's, it's dealing with human situations, acting humanly, and the flesh is on, and everything's on, and everyone's there, and the lights are on, everything's good to go. So it's like human, it's the, but, it, but it's the human condition in its, like, pristine form. So it's, it's vignettes into human, the human condition by masters of human, the human condition, which I think, think is the artistic literature, uh, literary giants of this. So that's it. And then the other vantage point is related to that, is they see the world in a way that any artist does, uh, with different eyes. So the idea of the arts, I was with, talking to an artist on a guest building episode with Sam Rosenthal. He says, you don't see with your eyes, you see through them. And the mm-hmm. idea of having a great artist is that you see through the eyes of an artist. And I don't have the eyes of the artist, but I can borrow them each evening um, and read parts of a novel or a literature event on paper. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about this recently too, because um, so I've, finish you and I both finished another year of graduate school. It's your second. It's my first, but I'm weaker than you are because you're more committed to German idealism and all its accompanying virtues. Um, Mm, and and for a variety, well, whatever we can debate this later. Um, 
you know, at a variety of points, I felt like I was just motivating, my, motivating myself on sheer willpower. Like I'd sit down at my desk, I'd think about the things that I had to do during the course of the day. I would feel terrible, and then I would start doing them. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and you can win those battles, you know, from day it's to day love. to day. It's exactly yeah. It's called love slash duty slash the same thing. That's a joke, but also he's not joking. That, I am true. Um, yes, yeah, so. So it, it, it takes an accumulated toll, or I suppose it takes a toll already connotes the fact that it's mm. accumulated. Uh, it takes a toll. And I, and I came to the end of this summer after having done like, you know, some TI conferences and then we did God's planning retreat, which was sweet. And then I bopped around to a couple of other small things and I got back home and I looked at my work and I was like, I, <laughs> I am very tired. No, uh, thank you. And, and I find it. What's that? Yeah, no, yeah, I work. No, thank you. Come back later. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and the, you know, whatever I thought, I basically like, this is why people take retreats. Um, and religious life is supposed to take retreat once a year for like five, six, seven days. But like, this is the point of a retreat. And for me, one of the places where I draw most sustenance, you know, after the manner of retreat is from reading literature, uh, which is mm. strange because I don't often like spiritual theology and that's not like an impious thing. Um, I just, a lot of it doesn't click with me or a lot of it, I just don't feel fits the form of life that we've adopted. And so it feels like strangers from a strange land testifying to an alien planet where you might not be invited. Um, and so, yeah, but, but for whatever reason, when I read literature, I am restored, um, mm. or I'm just kind of like encouraged or re-energized yeah. in my humanity. So I've been reading well, novels I, for the past mm. couple of days, which has been great, but yeah, you. Yeah, so I mean, I think part of this is, if I can make an analogy, which usually Father Jacob Bertrand hates these things, and I wish he was on this so I could, he'd hate on this too. But literature, in a sense, it's, it's like rejuvenating because you have a whole world in front of you, um, where we live most of our life, like, um, what is, what is uh, T.S. Eliot called, like, by spoons, teaspoons or something, it's beautiful, uh, I think it's in Proof Rock. Um, but it has a whole, there's a whole world that you get to visit on, so you can compass the whole thing and get a sense of the point of it. Um, and it's a bit like those little Charles Dickens statues that people put on their Christ, you know, Christmas, and they collect each one a piece, and there's like a house and a tavern, and there's people skating and such. And it's something so trite and pathetic and, and cliched, but at the same point, you love it. Like when Christmas comes out and people have these, I just want to go to their house and stare at them. Because you've got a little like New England village, and it's not true, but it's it's they're real people, and there's so much having so much more joy and happiness and meaning than you are at that moment, <laughs> and so you just you compass it. So I think literature gives you a vignette into the kind of good and non kitschy uh, Charles Dickens uh, porcelain villages. Nice. So speaking of porcelain villages, uh, the artist or the author for today's episode is one Graham Greene. And he's an author that many people have heard of, especially in Catholic circles. He's one of these 20th century British Catholic literary giants. So you'll hear him spoken of in the same conversation as people like Evelyn Waugh, for instance. Um, so Graham Greene lived from 1904 to 1991. His life spans almost the entirety of the 20th century. He's a convert to Catholicism. So he was received into the faith uh, in preparation for his marriage with his wife, Vivian, um, to whom he remained married throughout the entirety of his life or the entirety of his life after he got married, um, even despite certain marital difficulties because his wife refused to give him a divorce. Um, Graham Greene wrote over 20 novels, and we'll talk about those in what, what follows. But he's known especially as a kind of tortured Catholic soul. So, you know, all, all Catholic authors of the 20th century have their, um, I don't know, their, their, their liabilities, their flaws, their weaknesses. And um, yes, yeah, some of them are more evident than others. And I think Graham Greene's are probably most evident of all. So he's known to have had great struggles with the virtue of chastity. And, uh, you know, there are a variety of stories of his marital infidelity, one of which is somewhat famous. And it will lead us into our discussion of some of the themes that he broaches in his novels. So it's in the 1940s, and he is on pilgrimage with his mistress. You heard it right, folks. He's on pilgrimage with his mistress, one Catherine Walston. Uh, and they took the opportunity to hear mass at San Giovanni Rotondo when Padre Pio was there as the celebrant. And uh, after the mass, Padre Pio, having seen or understood, having had it revealed to him, whether by word of mouth or by the Lord directly, that Graham Greene was in attendance, Padre Pio invited him to visit with him after the mass. Uh, but then Graham Greene passed up on the opportunity. And the quote attributed to him after this event is kind of terrifying. He says, 
I didn't want to change my life by meeting a saint. I felt that there was a good chance that he was one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So posed with the opportunity of meeting a saint, he didn't pass up on it because it didn't fit into his schedule or because he would have had to travel too far. Nope, it was part of his schedule and the man was right before him. He just feared that he might have to give up his sinful ways, which he preferred to a life of conversion. And here we go. So Father Bonaventure, uh, I think that we're probably going to limit our conversation mostly to the Catholic novels of, uh, of one mm -hmm. Graham Greene, but maybe just lead us a little bit into his literary work. Some, some thoughts. Yeah. Um, so he's one of the, t I mean, I, so I, I love Graham Greene. I, I read him early and, uh, in my career, I suppose. And, um, he's one of the two novelists, two pieces of fiction that I actually, uh, cried over, uh, heart of the matter I did. And so it's beautiful. Um, I can remember, yeah, I was out in Oregon actually when I was reading it. It's profound. And Graham Greene's, I think the sin and grace is what kind of the two engines you could say that, that drive him. And I think that's in that little story, it encapsulates uh, his, his thematic power and engines of both these because he both understands his sinfulness, uh, the fact that he, he needs to change his life, that he's doing something wrong, right? Um, but and he also understands grace because he knows that there's sanctity here. There's someone different, uh, Padre Pio. So you have both these, and that's kind of a tension that sits with, with Graham Greene. And some people might think, well, he's, he's kind of Lutheran in that way. He's, you know, simultaneously justified and sinner. But he's really more Augustinian, uh, that he believes in the reality of the sacraments, the reality of grace in one's life. But he also doesn't downplay the need for that grace. Uh, he doesn't sugarcoat things. He doesn't say everything's fine. He says deeply we're twisted and in constant need of grace and that it's apparent. And his novels, at least the, the Catholic novels, So Hard at the Matter, Power and the Glory, people are probably most familiar with The Power and the Glory if they've read one of Grand Greene's novels. If they've seen any of his movies, they're probably familiar with The Quiet American, uh, starring uh, Michael Caine and Jonathan Franzen, I think, Fraser, Fraser, I think, Franzen's uh, an, another author, David Foster, Foster Wallace's friend. So, um, but then maybe they've seen, they, maybe they've heard of a Brighton Rock or something like this, but there are these, an end of the affair, maybe that's the, maybe that's also another short one. And the trick with, with Graham Greene is he both, he has sin is real and not to be papered over, nor to be despaired over, because usually there's an event in his novels where there's an ambiguous uh in breaking of grace, and he's good about it, except in one novel, which um, he blows the cover, I think, in that you could, you can decide whether you choose to accept this or not, whether you choose to accept this as a moment of grace or as something else. There's an ambiguity to the supernatural in the natural, uh, and that's gorgeous. So that's his Catholic novels are built around this notion of sin and grace, and the inbreaking of the sacraments, that is not mechanical and not magical, but something mysterious, and that one has to appropriate that. All right, well, let's go into a conversation mm. of themes, but before doing that, let's kind of backstop it against just the thumbnailiest of thumbnail sketches. So we're going to talk mostly, we're going to talk almost exclusively about his Catholic novels, which are five. So Father Bonaventure mentioned them. Let's just summarize them. Power and the Glory, End of the Affair, Heart of the Matter, Brighton Rock, and Monsignor Quixote. Oh, Monsignor Quixote, yep. Um, so maybe just quick thumbnail sketches of each. Power and the Glory is mm. set during the persecution of the Catholic Church in the early 20th century in Mexico. And there's a priest called the Whiskey Priest, whose name is not mentioned throughout the course of the book, who has a fall from grace, ends up, you know, living with a woman. And, you know, it recounts some of his struggles with the virtue of chastity. But then he ends up having a kind of return to the practice of the sacrament, the celebration of the sacraments, and ultimately suffers for it. Um, Brighton Rock tells the story of like a kind of child gang at this seaside resort town, effectively, in England. And they're kind of budding nihilists. It's the type of thing you might encounter in Dostoevsky's Demons. Uh, and they decide to commit a murder. And then it's the story of them being consumed as they are pursued. So it's, you know, like their, their own patterns of self-destruction as they experience the pressure of the hunt. And then the end of the affair tells a story of uh, one Bendrix who has a kind of amorous encounter with one Sarah Miles, and then of his relationship with her, and then with her husband Henry, as she has an experience of the Lord, and that leads ultimately to a kind of reckoning 
for the other characters in the story. And then I know Father Bonaventure, if you want to give a little thumbnail sketch of Heart of the Matter and Monsignor Quixote. Um, Heart of the Matter is to do with a, um, it's in Africa, set there in North Africa, I believe. Scobie is a, is kind of a government official and he's, his wife kind of comes and goes because she's got an illness, but he, he has a mistress there. Um, you can see a kind of pattern with green by now. Um, and his coming to terms with the relationships with the corruption, uh, involved there and, uh, his own experience of this, of this mistress and how he's going to, how he's going to relate to his wife and his mistress and his kind of his relation to the faith. And then Monsignor Coyote is something of a, something of a different thing. Um, it's a, it's a story of, a, it's a, so Spain, I think, is it Spain? Or is it Mexico? Yep. Um, this is Mexico and Spain. there's a, oh, Spain, sorry, Spain. It's, and it's, it's after the, the, it's in the Republic. And so there's, it's a, there's a communist mayor and there's a, uh, a, a priest, a parish priest who has a bishop come by him at some point and he's dr- the bishop's drunk and the bishop makes the priest the little local priest a monsignor and that means that he's now entitled to wear purple socks and so the communist uh the ex communist mayor is his friend uh and he go on, forces uh the priest to go and get his purple socks so it's a quest in a way that of course it's off of don quixote but so so the mayor plays sancho panja and then the priest is uh is the uh, Don Quixote character, and uh, they just always get into trouble and things. It's a bit like that if you're familiar with this Italian um, uh, Don Camillo stories. It's a bit like that. You have a communist kind of communist mayor, government official who's something that, about the faith attracts him, and then the priest is this eccentric kind of character. So that's a little bit of a romp, um, but it has the same kind of miracle at the end of it that's ambiguous and deciding what the mayor is going to do about this. Nice. So that gives us a good background or a good kind of backstop for our discussion of themes. So with that, let's go to our break. And on the other side, we'll get into uh, the kind of literary genius of Graham Greene. So stick with us. You are listening to Godsplaining. Visit us at godsplaining.org to listen to our episodes, shop our store, and donate to our podcast. All gifts go to improving the podcast and bringing the gospel to more listeners. Thanks for your support. All right. Welcome back to God's Planning. We're talking about literature and Graham Greene, one of the great Catholic British authors of the 20th century. I suppose when you say the word great and follow it with a bunch of adjectives that might, um, I don't know, mitigate against the greatness, but that's okay in this particular instance because... Britain is a great century, I mean, excuse me, it's a great locale for literature. 19th and 20th century British literature is kind of the height of the novelistic arts. And there are many great literary Catholics. So to be classed among them is high praise. So here then, having set up a little bit of the plots, the backgrounds to the stories of Graham Greene, specifically those Catholic stories, which are most famous in these circles, let's talk then, let's dive into uh, some of the themes that Father Bonaventure broached in the first half of the episode. So let's talk first about sin and grace. I think we want to say that in Graham Greene's novels, sin and grace are both operative, or even we might say real, but real in different senses. So maybe lead us into that conversation, Father Bonaventure. Yeah, I think, again, we talked earlier about the kind of Augustinian vision, and we're in God's planning, we tend to be Thomas here. And Thomas, of course, is a great interpreter of Augustine, but Augustine has we could say a less cheery view you could say about creation so thomas is you know believes in the integrity of nature in a sense and augustine has has that but augustine also realizes the fall i mean you could say he didn't he invented original sin or what have you but he he cares deeply about the sinfulness of the world and doesn't sugarcoat that and graham green follows in that path so his his characters are are sinful um not in the sense of being evil like it's, I guess you want to make a distinction here between being an evil character, which would be t- malicious and ten- bad intentions, a kind of demonic character, you could say. They're not that, but they're also not just men and women who are stuck in their circumstances and make mistakes, this sort of thing, this sort of Aristotelian account of maybe sin or something, not right judgment or put Jesus around thing. They're, uh, they're fragmented and weak and selfish uh, they're all the things that kind of we recognize in ourselves in a way, but magnified in a realistic way. He makes them larger than life, or at least he makes them types of sinful characters. And I think we can recognize something of ourselves in them, even though they're magnified. So, for instance, in Power and the Glory, the Whiskey Priest, um, 
is is a priest who's committed to the bottle and to women, women and wine. And he has he has uh, relations outside. You know, he's he's broken his vow, and during during this, this persecution, he's also uh, just always drunk. Um, so, and it's not like he makes excuses for that. He understands that it's his choice. It, those are his choices. So he accepts who he is, um, but he he knows he wants to be better. Uh, or we think about, for instance, in uh, in in Heart of the Matter, uh, Scobie, the main the main character in there. This is a man who knows he shouldn't be having a mistress um, because his, even even with he doesn't make excuses about his wife. His wife isn't exactly the best character in the world, but he doesn't make excuses about it. He it, he he has a mistress and he knows it's wrong, and yet he's trying to struggle with what to do about. It. And you might think, oh, this is really easy. We just need to. But I think Graham Greene forces us to realize that actually sin is not that easy. Sometimes that it's it's sometimes really deep in our lives. And it's a real thing. It has real effects on us and those around us. So he has that aspect of, of a kind of darker vision. And a lot of his, his environs even are night. He does a lot of things at night. Um, it's always raining in Heart of the Matter. There's this kind of oppressive character to things. And I suspect that's true for, for some of the other, other ones as well. So there's this a depression about it. Um, that if it was just that, you'd be stuck with a Cormac McCarthy novel. But you're not. <laughs> So I think maybe maybe by way of summary, you mentioned the Aristotelian background to his understanding of human weakness or weakness of will. And I think oftentimes when you read novels, Catholic novels, there's this um, temptation to be edifying or a temptation to give hope, but to give hope in maybe an overly facile way. So if you think about it, you know, you've got virtuous people who know what's good and find it easy to do what's good. You've got continent people who know what's good find it hard to do what's good, but eventually choose for it. You have incontinent people who know what's good and they struggle and they ultimately fail to do it. And then you got vicious people who know what's good, reject it wholly and do easily and joyfully what is in fact evil. And I think a lot of, a lot of Catholic authors try to show us the continent becoming virtuous, you know? Uh, but I think, <laughs> I think that um, Graham Greene is often showing the incontinent pitched between a kind of paper thin continents and a kind of, I don't know, dreadful viciousness. So there's mm -hmm. still a kind of ambivalence to human choice insofar as it, it could go either way. But like you make this emphasis with his Augustinian bent, he sees all of humanity as basically pertaining to a massa damnata, slumping to perdition. And if one is plucked out of that, that mass of clay, it is only by a kind of peculiar grace. So then when it comes to talking about grace... Mm. Um, you'll, you'll find some, some authors talking about a kind of cheap grace. So I'm thinking here of like, for instance, Ernest Hemingway grew fatigued by the ends of stories, the ends of novels, because he found that they often cheapened the narrative. And so he himself just kind of ceased to finish those stories. This is especially clear in his short stories. Usually somebody like dies. And then that's at, I mean, that's true too of his novels, but there isn't an attempt to mm. wrap things up nicely mm. because he didn't want to cheapen the effect, the kind of narrative effect, the thematic effect of what he communicated. And certainly it cannot be said of Graham Greene that grace is bought cheaply. Uh, the currency there is, the, well, I should say the exchange on the currency is very steep indeed. So maybe talk a little bit about Graham Greene's sense of grace. How is it to be gained? How do we consent to and cooperate with it? Well, it has, it has a, again, I said, the difference between, uh, and we'll, this is related to the sacraments too, but on a more general level, the, the mystery aspect. So grace is a mysterious presence in in his novels, and usually at certain points throughout, but especially at the end of the novel, there's an inbreaking, an event, or some kind of conversion or moment of decision. So grace, grace in Graham Greene's novels are things that one responds to in a particular way, and the character responds in a particular way, and then the reader, I take it is to be asked how he or she is to respond to this sort of thing. So in, uh, in Heart of the... And, and it's ambiguous, again, as I said, um, grace, because it's, it's in a sense for him, there's an existential kind of, you can only understand the grace given to you. So from the outside, there has this kind of, it's, well, it could just be random or something like this, a coincidence, or it could be that, and only the person knows. So in the Heart of the Matter, for instance, um, Scobie has is just involved in incredible corruption involving and, and then he's got the mistress situation and at the end of it he has this he's committed this horrible crime against his his boy 
um, but he has this this vision um, as he's as he is uh, falling dead. Um, he's he's committed. He's he's taken some pills. To a spoiler alert. And he's committed suicide to, to get out of this. And he hears this knocking at the door. Um, and he's, he's struggling to answer this, this, this message, this experience he's having. And he even the sentence begins, but you finish it. And what's beautiful, beautiful about that novel is, my sense is, you, how you finish that is how you see Scobie responding and how you, resp- how you incline yourself to believe whether that was God coming to him at the end to finally grasp him as he gives his real, tells his real love to God or whether it's just him finally finishing out and this is just another mockery of, of, of human attempts to avoid the most painful and difficult situations. This happens at the end of uh, Monsignor Coyote in another way. His final Eucharist has this mystical quality to it that even the, gov- the, the mayor has to kind of recognize or, or sense. Um, it's the same thing is a similar decision that has to be done in the, in the end of the, um, the whiskey priest. So in power and glory, I just mentioned quickly that in the end of the fair in my, in my judgment, at least, um, it's the, he misses the Graham green, Graham green misses Graham green because it's not ambiguous. Like you don't have any question about whether this was a hallucination or something. It's an absolute miracle. And it does convert the person, the, the, again, the, 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 the man involved with, with, with the woman, um, but it does so through the kind of hammer. And it's maybe, maybe in sort of Freudian sense, Graham Greene had to do this to show you what he's not doing in most things because it, that has the kind of cheap grace hammer blow to, well, if you don't accept it, you just don't understand what you're doing. All of his other ones are not like that. That's my susp- I don't know if you feel the same way about the mysterious aspect that one has to accept and sub- the aspect about that. Yeah, I think that's almost unnecessary. Um, so that comes at the end of the book. And early on in the book, I mean, relatively early in the book, Sarah is with her lover, Bendrix, and a bomb falls very close to the apartment, which, you know, she thinks it precipitates the death of her lover. He's fine, but it shakes her to the core. And then subsequently, she kind of like finds herself going into a church, and then she spends longer and longer in the church. And so I think that it, um, you know, those would be the strong and subtle movements of grace throughout the course of the book, right? Like a near-death experience is something that, you know, others have had happen to them at some point in their life. It's a thing with which some people will be able to identify. And then that being the, the strong, as it were, pull of grace. And then the more subtle movements like feeling drawn to go into a church, feeling, feeling drawn to think it through or to talk it out or just to be there and quiet. Um, and how that gradually takes hold of her life. I think that's another thing with which people can kind of sympathize. Um, and then the final testimony to her conversion is this miraculous moment that you describe where she kisses a man with a disfigured face and then his face is cured. And that may or may not play a role in Bendrick's conversion, although mm-hmm. it seems like he's equally bewildered yeah. by you know the fact that he didn't die, by the fact that the woman whom he knew has changed so very much. And... Um, yeah, it's just not for reasons that he would have anticipated. So I'm not as scandalized by that end. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, but maybe, I don't know, I think Graham Greene himself operated in a variety of genres. And I think that's maybe to his credit that he's able to see uh, the different aspects of humanity and to accentuate them in the way in which, and maybe we have to have an episode on Evelyn Waugh. Like when you read Evelyn Waugh's mm-hmm. Brideshead Revisited, the Sword of Honor trilogy, so... Officers and gentlemen, men at arms, unconditional surrender. There you have this really like sober approach to human love and to, well, like basically love of friendship, erotic love, and then divine love. And this kind of inner working of the three as it plays out in these very seemingly mundane affairs um, in a way that's, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's delightful. But then you read other books of uh, Evelyn Waugh and they're just some of the most sneering or scorning kind of satire that you've ever come across. Like I just read The Loved One and it's just like, withering, hilarious, or I like decline and fall is that way or handful of dust. And so he's able to operate in these different ways. And I think you see that something sometimes too with Graham Greene, that it's not so much like this is a failure of his adherence to a rule, but it might be just a different mode of literary expression. Um, certainly Monsignor Quixote is the most farcical. Uh, so yep. that, that kind of breaks the mold a bit, but I mean, he wrote, he wrote lots of stuff. So yeah. I think you I think you're the 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 wall aspect brings up the the other big theme that makes 
Green interesting to me, and I think to Catholics, it makes, in a sense, like, what makes him a Catholic author, or is he just an author who happens to be Catholic? But the Catholic author is, one, the, the sin and grace thing, but that doesn't make him particularly Catholic. Christ, Protestants would have that, I suppose, in some fashion, although it has its own valences and Catholic uh, tinges to it, as we say. But the thing is, the other thing is, which he has with Waugh, is the sort of the sacraments that pursue one, that God pursues one in grace to save one through particular means that you cannot escape. So there's a sort of sacramental destiny, in a way, um, that with Eve- with Evelyn Waugh, maybe we'll have to we'll probably do Evelyn Waugh at some point, in Brideshead, where the, the Charles just can't, he can't escape, nor can the family escape uh, the the fact that they are Catholic, and Charles can't escape the fact that this, this family is Catholic, and he's going to have to convert from... in the, So there's this sacrament, the graces come down to save the sinner in the sacraments, and that's true with Graham Greene's novel, so in The Power and the Glory, the whiskey priest has put all these opportunities to to apostatize, continue to apostatize, to run away, and he just can't, his, his sacrament of orders keeps him. It's like this thing that pursues him, and in a sense has determined ahead of time. And there's a beautiful, you see it where he's, he's finally gotten wine, in a sense, to, uh, to finally, he wants to celebrate the sacraments. So you think he's finally turned around on this, but then the wine is all drunk by, by those in the party. And so he loses the, the means to celebrate the sacrament. And so you think this is, it should be, he would take this as a sign of God to be like, that's it, I tried. I, I did what I need to do. Um, I've got this, but this isn't how it's going to go. And I'm going to escape persecution and death, and you're not helping me. And yet, he can't. He has to turn around, even when presented with all the opportunities in the world. So he's hunted and haunted by Christ as in Persona Christi, I think. And there's similar in the, in the other novels as well, that the sacraments actually are real, and they grasp one, and they set out a destiny that one can fight against, but ultimately God, in his grace, calls one. And that's another Augustinian, you could say, but a sacramental Augustinian perspective, I think, of Graham Greene. Yeah, and I think it's sacramental both formally and materially in the sense that um, you get the impression that the incarnate order matters, right? That God has mm. suffused it with a kind of grace-giving agency and as a result of which um, it's pregnant with purpose. But also materially, the sacraments feature prominently in quite a few of his stories. So you mentioned the whiskey priests in particular, uh, but then you think about you know the end of the affair and Sarah's haunting of the church. Brighton Rock has a very potent um, confession scene at the end, and Heart of the Matter has a very, very bracing one at the beginning, where mm-hmm. you know Scobie goes to make a confession. He does not have firm purpose of amendment, and as a result of which, absolution is deferred, which for him is a kind of sign of his interior, well, paralysis. You know, the fact that sin has taken such a hold on his life that he can't even muster the desire to move beyond it. Which brings into stark contrast or kind of brings into relief that final scene of knocking at the mm-hmm. door. The question being like, is it the door of the heart? Is it the door of the confessional in a kind of way? But at the very least, if you take this sacramentally realistic approach, there's something that's going on that's deeper than the merely psychological. It's not just a thought that he's having. It's not just a heightened awareness to his own interior states. There's something that's, that's changing. There's something that's moving. There's something that's imparting a kind of grace or transforming in a in a certain sense and i think that's really powerful boom well i think that we have come to the end of this here episode at least time wise um if not content wise so um yeah father bonaventure last thought about graham green a final commendation um i think if you take him on the augustinian vein you don't worry so much about perhaps the despair in this because his 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 theme is a different tinge and it's a little darker to get at this more realistic and this more grace filled thing, but at the same time, um, he you know you don't want to overemphasize the the sinfulness of things and say oh we can't do anything better. So I think I think people need not worry I think you need not be scared of him nor scandalized by him as much as we might think ourselves if we understand that he's doing this from a more Augustinian and darker route and then of course remind ourselves about the sacramental realism. So I. Th- one can read Green, Green with great Catholic profit, although um, there is a caution to be to be had there. As with any sin involved, if it looks staring into darkness, it's always possible that it traps your eye. Yeah, yeah. 
And, and you know, he was, he was accused by some of his contemporaries, including Eva Lenoir and Hans Urs von Balthasar, mm -hmm. that his approach to sin and grace was not, not, not just Augustinian, but kind of beyond that, almost quietistic, or that yeah. he attributed too great of a mystique to his sinful characters, as it were, so, or that he's even a somewhat fatalistic or deterministic in his approach to these matters. So it's not to say that he's above reproach. And, you know, you sometimes wonder when reading these stories, a lot of which have autobiographical elements, if he's not just working out um, the, the torturous twists and turns of his own very wrung heart. Um, but nonetheless, there is, there is, like you said, profit to be gained by it. So uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll leave you. So thanks so much for listening to this episode of God's Planning. We appreciate your efforts, appreciate your efforts to, uh, to share, to review, to like, and to all those things which help others to hear the good word. Uh, a special word of thanks to our, to our Patreon donors for making uh, many of these things possible. Um, some updates are we're having guests on more frequently. So you'll have episodes of guest planning every second and fourth Monday of each month, excuse me, every first and third Monday of each month. Uh, so look for uh, a guest planning episode, the first and third Monday of each month, beginning in September. And then uh, we'll have live planning every second and fourth Friday of each month. So we'll just try to stagger those things just to give you um, you know, a measured pace, a measured, uh, a measured pace of content. So the next uh, live splitting episode will be on Friday. Uh, let's see, that'd be August 27th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you can hop on YouTube and submit your questions and we'll, admit, we'll answer as many as we can uh, given our rapid rate of speech. Um, so yes, our prayers are for you. Please pray for us and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on God's Planning. Thanks for listening to God's Planning a work of the Dominican Friars of the province of St. Joseph. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Leave a review on your podcast app and visit us at godsplaining.org.